Our Old Testament reading is found from Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. We rise for the Alleluia and reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see that these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. Th these are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils and will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents, and have them put to death. And you will be hated for all, by all, for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you guys remember the Like a Rock Chevy commercials? You guys sing it with me? Like a rock. Come on, you can do better than that. Like a rock, right? Very, very catchy. I got to watch some of those as part of my sermon prep the other day on YouTube. It was very, very good. Now, 
they're great. They're great commercials. And in the background, there's always a narrator who says, Chevy trucks, the trucks you can depend on, the trucks that last. See, somebody else got it too. I love that. Now, I don't happen to own a Chevy truck, but I do love Chevys. I have a 2008 Chevy Trailblazer, and it's a fantastic vehicle. But you know what? Lately, it's got some issues. It's got some things that need to be worked out, and it was in the shop a couple weeks ago. And I was very surprised when it needed repairs. There I was, just minding my own business, going out to start my car, and boom. There's a couple of lights that come on on the dash, and I talk to my mechanic, who is very good, and he tells me it needs a $600 repair. Now that surprised me. But should it? Should it surprise me? The vehicle's 13 years old. It has 140,000 miles on it. Should I be surprised that things are wearing out? But it was surprising to me, because as often this is the case, I have come to rely on that vehicle. It's been very good to me. We, uh, it protected my family when we were rear-ended a few uh, years ago. And between living in Minnesota and, and also living here, I can safely say that the, um, the four-wheel drive has gotten plenty of use in the wintertime, and it's been very, very good. It's a very reliable vehicle. It's a safe vehicle. And it usually starts right away when I want it to, but usually without the warning lights. But the truth is, the car won't last forever, will it? One day, that vehicle uh, won't be on the road anymore. Now, I plan to drive it until the wheels fall off, although I hope that the wheels don't actually fall off, because that would be really dangerous. But, you know, it just when it doesn't run anymore, hopefully it'll be a, a safe situation. But someday, something will happen, right? And my like a rock Chevy will be in a junkyard somewhere, getting scrapped for parts and recycled and whatever else they do with cars that are at the end of their lives. As much as we might marvel at the strength and reliability of our vehicles, they do have a limited lifespan, don't they? And we know that going in. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus is coming out of the temple for the last time. This takes place toward the end of his earthly life as he's preparing to be betrayed and crucified. And as he and his disciples walk out of the temple, the disciples are looking up. One of his disciples looks up at the temple and he looks around the city and he declares, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. That reminds me of going to visit New York. You can know right away who all the tourists are, right? How can you tell? They're all looking up. So all the native New Yorkers, they're all kind of shuffled down, you know, shuffling in and out of cabs, going back and forth to work, looking down at their cell phones. But the tourists, especially if they haven't been to a big city like that, they're looking up, right? It's very impressive. It's very amazing. And so what was Jesus' response to that? What was Jesus' response to these uh, fishermen from Galilee who are so impressed by these amazing buildings? And this amazing temple. One of them leans over to Jesus and says, Wow, teacher, would you look at that? Isn't it amazing? These buildings are so big and beautiful. And their tour guide, Jesus, responds with, Do you see these great buildings? There, I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That is an uplifting tour, right? <laughs> Thanks. It almost sounds like Jesus doesn't like the temple or has an issue with it, but that's not the case, is it? Truth is, Jesus loved the temple. It was the beautiful. It was a place where God dwelled for a time. Many of God's people were served there. But despite all that, it was a building made with hands. And Jesus knew that roughly 40 years later, it was going to be destroyed. So as Jesus often did during his earthly ministry, he uses this conversation as an opportunity to teach. And his lesson is about faithfulness. God doesn't judge our results. He judges our faithfulness. And our faithfulness will be tested. It gets tested every day. In fact, one of the main ways that our faithfulness is tested is when the things we tend to rely on and put our trust in, the things we think of as our rocks, disappoint us when they fail us. And just in our text this morning, there are three key places that Jesus identifies that are sandy places where we don't want to build our house because it'll eventually be swept away. The first one that Jesus mentions in our text is false religion. Look at verse 5. 
And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. So the first thing we have to make sure of is that we aren't putting our hope in religious leaders, especially those of false faiths. Yes, we should listen to our pastors, but only because they preach the true word of God. We shouldn't be following religious leaders based on how popular they are or how charismatic they are, but by how faithful to the word they are. Because when it's all said and done, the false religions of this world, and that includes false Christianity, will fall away. And all religious leaders will be held accountable to the word of God. And that is how all of us should judge and discern between them. The second place Jesus identifies that we shouldn't put our trust is in politics. Jesus goes on in our text, starting at verse 8. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. So often we are tempted to put our trust in the nations of this world, to believe that if the political candidate we like or the party we belong to gets in power, that suddenly all of our problems will go away. Guess what? I've been alive long enough to see both political parties, major political parties in America, come into power and go out of power. Do we still have problems? What do you think? I know some of you disagree with me, but we do have some problems, don't we? And the truth is that the nations of Jesus' day don't even exist anymore. They've fallen. The point being, that's not where we should put our trust either. Yes, we should be good citizens. We should vote. We should participate in the process and let our conscience guide us in that. But if you put all your hope and your trust in the government, I can promise you will be disappointed. And finally, Jesus talks about family. Now, you love your family. I love my family. But once again, even our family doesn't last forever. We pray that it lasts a long time, that everyone stays healthy and happy, of course. But listen to what Jesus says in verses 12 and 13. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. How often have you watched a TV show or a movie and someone says, the only thing that matters is family. Family is the only thing that matters. Family is the most important thing. I've seen and heard that a lot. And the truth is that family is a tremendous blessing from God. Complicated blessing, is that fair to say? But a tremendous blessing from God. Yet our families disappoint us, don't they? We fight, we grumble, they too will one day fall. So yes, be good husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and daughters and sons. Be all of that. But don't put all your hope and your trust for the future in your family. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to you. Love them, cherish them, care for them, yes. But with the recognition that family isn't where God has ultimately called us to put our hope and our trust. Now, after saying all of this, Jesus ends with these words, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So what does that mean? If we can't completely rely on the buildings we put up, if we can't completely rely on the religious leaders of our day, if we can't completely rely on our country and its politics, or even our own families, where can we put our trust? What can sustain us to the end? When everything that we have can be taken away, what is left? The answer is Christ. When all those things are taken away, we learn to rely on Christ. The place where we can invest, the place we can put our hope and trust, the thing that will last is Christ. His word stands forever. Now, depending on how long it is until the Lord returns in glory, this very church may not stand here someday. I pray that's not the case, but who knows? However, the ministry that is done here, the ministry of the word, will stand forever. We don't invest in our church solely because we want to have a nice building or nice pastors, although we certainly, these are great things. The building is a place your pastors serve you with Christ's word and sacrament. It's where Christian friendships are built. It's where we gather together for fellowship and we study the scriptures together. And your gifts and your offerings and your uh, volunteer work help make all of this possible. But ultimately, it's not this temple you should rely on, or even ultimately your pastors, but rather the Jesus who is preached here. It's all about the word. 
the word that calls us to repentance in the law and comforts us with the grace and forgiveness of the gospel. All of this, this church, this place, only has value insofar as it is used to preach Christ and him crucified. Amen? Apart from him, we are nothing and we can do nothing. But in him, we have life and hope and salvation. These signs that Jesus describes in our text are things that we could observe at any point in history. Is that fair to say? The purpose of including them isn't to help us time and predict his coming, but rather to encourage us to be always ready to receive him when he comes. Everything that men build will one day be torn down, but what God builds will stand forever. If you know that everything's going to be destroyed, that everything's going to be torn down, and that you don't know the day or the hour that it's going to happen, what are we to do? Are we to despair? To throw up our hands in frustration and give up the fight because one day it'll all end? Or are we called to make the most of the time that we have? God doesn't judge us on our results. He doesn't judge us on how big our church gets or how much money we give or how much we volunteer. Yes, he wants his kingdom to grow. Yes, he wants us to be good stewards of our gifts. But the one thing he wants above all else is faithfulness. Do we cling to the cross and to God's word? Do we confess our sins and come to the altar to receive forgiveness? Do we fight against false teaching and speak the truth in love, even when it's difficult or dangerous for us to do? Do we stand firm to the end? Because, my friends, Jesus isn't like a rock. He is the rock. The rock upon which all our hope and trust is built. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our foundation and will have us with him forever. Even as big monuments and institutions and nations will one day fall, such simple things remain. The cross, the Lord's Supper, holy baptism, water and word. These simple gifts bring us something that will last forever. The forgiveness that Jesus bled for, the grace earned on his cross, flows to us each week in these simple divine gifts. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even as our cars and our bodies and age and wear out, Jesus stands firm. He is our rock. And on the Stewardship Commitment Sunday, we are blessed to have a joyful response to his grace as we make our commitments to invest in the future of this church with our time, talents, and treasures so that the gifts of Christ can be shared with generations yet unborn. It's a legacy of faith and a legacy of grace, a legacy of the word. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.